The scripture reading this morning is from John, the 12th chapter. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The word of the Lord. What does love smell like? A box of chocolates? A dozen roses? How about the scent of a very expensive perfume? But I don't imagine it's often that we equate too much perfume with love. More often than not, our reaction is, wow, a few less sprays this morning would have been helpful. (laughs) But Mary's love for Jesus is a rather smelly event. Much like grace upon grace should be, and has been all along in John. A dab on the neck won't do when it comes to matching the love Jesus has shown us. You see, a grace upon grace love tastes like the best wine and a ton of it when you least expect it, and you knew I was going to say that. It feels like being able to stand on your own two feet when all of your life you have only known the world that has made sure to keep you down. It looks like seeing the world God created for the very first time. It sounds, it sounds like your name being called when you feel like you're dying. It sounds like experiencing the gentle touch of the one you love. Mary's act of love is a sign of abundance, just like Jesus' signs of abundance were acts of love. And like every sign so far, the the abundance is in the details. A pound of perfume. Okay, when was the last time you bought a pound of perfume? (laughs) Like never. Chanel number five, Clinique, Happy, DKNY, Be Delicious, Ralph Lauren, about the most you can get at a time is like, what, three ounces, 1.8 ounce? I don't know about you, but it would take me about 10 years to go through a pound of perfume. And it's 
it's costly perfume, right? No knockoffs from Walmart or Walgreens. This is, this is the expensive stuff. The department store selection that they spray on those little cards and hand out to you as you walk through. The kind you ask for as a birthday gift or a, a Christmas present. The kind you would never buy for yourself. And it's made of pure nard, meaning that it was not spliced with something cheaper to make it go farther. Nothing added to squeeze out a few extra sprays from the bottle. And the house is filled with the fragrance, so much so that it, that it lodges into every nook and cranny, almost infusing the floorboards with the scent. There's, there's nowhere you can go without smelling it. It seeps into your clothing, even into your, even into your skin. You'll be able to smell it for days. It will linger long. And the perfume costs 300 denarii, almost a year's salary in those days. And one denarii was a day's wage. So for fun, let's do a little math. Let's say, let's say, let's do for today, $8 an hour, eight hours a day for 300 days. That's $19,200. That's $20,000 of pre precious perfume poured on Jesus' feet. This is grace upon grace kind of love. This is, this is abundant love. It's the kind of love that has to be shown because words are not enough. And they never were. Mary's silence speaks volumes. Because too much so-called love these days lands in empty words, hollow promises, and meaningless utterances. If you can't feel it, smell it, taste it, see it, and hear it, well then, is it really love? So much of what we, what we say is love ends up being nothing even close to what love is supposed to be. But be ready, <laughs> when you start going around and acting out this kind of abundant love, a love, a love without words, but a love that might be heard louder than ever, well, <laughs> expect resistance, expect suspicion, expect rejection. Most people do not know what to do with this kind of love. Dismissing it outright can't really believe it. And Judas proves that theory right. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how Judas shows up in the midst, in the middle of this display of abundant love? It's as if he just can't stand it. It's as if there is only so much love he can take, only so much love he can witness. And I don't think Judas is alone in that feeling. In fact, right after Mary's display of love comes the chief priest's decision to kill the object of Jesus' love. Lazarus. 
Yes, this is what we do with love, especially love that can't be ignored. We, we insist that it can't be true. We don't think we're deserving of such love. We make excuses that, that deem us unlovable. We believe the voices of shame and guilt and unworthiness, those voices, those voices that say, you are not enough. And when we are honest with ourselves, we are more like Judas than we will ever want to admit or ever will admit. Love like this, abundant, intimate, vulnerable, well, that gets a little, that gets a little too close for comfort for a lot of us. And also, we allow ourselves to think that others do not deserve God's love or stay silent when people say who God loves and who God doesn't or make excuses for those who try to justify their hatred with a facade and feigning of Christian principles. We put boundaries around love set up stipulations for love. We control love, confine it, contain it, and detain it. But love wins. Love always wins. Friends, we like to, we like to say, what would Jesus do? We've got it on bracelets and tattoos and screensavers and bumper stickers. Of course, we conveniently forget that flipping over tables and chasing people with a whip is a viable option as well. (laughs) But we don't often ask the question of this story. What would Jesus do when one of his friends wants to say, I love you? What would Jesus do if, if one of his disciples came up to him and said, Jesus, Jesus, you have shown me so much love. Please, please let me love you. Look at what Jesus does in this story. He just is. <laughs> what does Jesus do? He doesn't say, oh, I couldn't possibly marry. It's such a nice gesture, but not necessary. (laughs) Jesus doesn't say, I'm sure there is is some more meaningful cause or someone more important than I who deserves such devotion. Jesus doesn't say, no, no, really, really, Mary, you, you shouldn't. Jesus does not stop her. He receives her love. And why? Because he loves her. This is what true mutual love looks like. Jesus accepts her love in in silent, in intimate reception, in in mutual affection because, because maybe Jesus needs her love. Right here and right now and more than ever, after all, we're coming to the end. To the end of Jesus' ministry. Because the very next day, Jesus will enter into Jerusalem one last time. And we're coming to the end of Jesus' life. Because in the very next chapter, the hour will come. The foot washing, the farewell discourse, Jesus' final prayer, and then his arrest in the garden. If there is ever a time Jesus needs to know he's loved, really know it, 
really feel it, really believe it, it's here and now. And I suspect that the amount of Jesus' gratitude for Mary's love likely matched the fragrance of the perfume that filled the room. It's Mary's love that sets in motion the events of the hour. Much like Jesus' mother sets in motion Jesus' ministry. We talk about women's roles as disciples of Jesus, that they are disciples, just as much as the name 12, so there. (laughs) But this story shows us that it's the love of these two women, the mother of Jesus and Mary, that make Jesus' ministry happen. It's the love that he experienced from his mother and Mary that he then shows to the disciples. Because he will then wash their feet. He'll even wash the feet of Judas, who would then abandon not only Jesus, but also his friends. He'll even wash the feet of Peter whose denial is then foretold. The kind of love to which we are called, dear friends, is a no-holds-barred love. A love that might very well push us into places and spaces where we do not wish to go. Places that demand that we speak up and speak out for justice. Places that demand that we speak up and speak out for gun control. For those hated and persecuted, for those oppressed and marginalized, thrown out of their communities, for those abandoned on an island. Places like Sikar, places that will try to silence us, places like the cross. A love that loves even those who might leave us. A love that loves even those who reject us. A love that loves even those who would conspire to cast us out. An overflowing, unending kind of love, an abundant love, a grace upon grace kind of love. A love that can't stop at, that's sufficient, or that's succinct. A love that can't stop at, that's enough, or that has an end in sight. A love that can't stop at the level of love the world is willing to deem acceptable or even tolerable. Because we are called to a grace upon grace love that lays down one's life for one's friends. But also, also, We're asked to receive this love. No excuses, no pretexts. No times when you say, Jesus, yeah, that's enough. I don't need it right now. A love that makes possible our own ministry, our own preaching, our own witness, because really, how could we do it otherwise? A love that, yes, might indeed set our course for Jerusalem, but a love that gives us the power to turn water into wine. A love that might very well lead to John 3.16 coming true. Dear friends, 
Let Jesus do what Jesus does best. Let Jesus do what Jesus keeps trying to do, but you keep saying, no, Jesus, you shouldn't. I couldn't. Let Jesus love you. Amen. Well, welcome to all of you who are here participating in Working Preacher Presents, The Craft of Preaching. We're really excited to have all of you here during this uh, three-day conference where, as our brochure says, a master class in all things preaching. And so we're delighted that you are taking time out of your schedule to be here and to think about uh, an important aspect of our ministry and sometimes the most as we uh, do ministry for the sake of God's love in the world. Just a note of introduction about the format that this conference took last year. Last year we changed uh, this conference significantly. How many of you were here last year? Okay, so you know what I'm uh, talking about. But for those of you who were not here, last year uh, we moved from what was really a mini festival of homiletics <laughs> to a way in which we can provide and host conversations around preaching that really get at some of the tasks and skills and techniques that you want to be able to address in your preaching. Uh, one person said, I just want to be a better preacher, whatever that means, but we'll figure it out by Wednesday. So. <laughs> But we don't get many opportunities to do this. We go to conferences where we hear preachers and we hear workshops and participate in amazing worship. And sometimes we go home and think, well, now what? <laughs> what do I do with that? How do, I, how do I make that work in my own life? And so we decided that a different kind of conference was needed, a conference that got sort of behind the scenes, if you will, of our task and our craft and the art of preaching. So that is the nature and the spirit of this conference. And so we are very glad to have you here. As a result, uh, we changed the format of the preachers and the speakers. So it used to be that the, the presenters would always preach because, you know, it's a preaching conference. So they should probably preach. <laughs> and so we would have them preach, but then they would do a lecture on maybe a, I'm looking at Barbara, because maybe a lecture on a book they're working on or something that they've been thinking about in preaching and that had a more of a general sense to it. And this time in this conference, what we've done is changed the format of that as well. So that the preachers or the presenters are asked to uh, come to this conference and preach a sermon, and then they are asked to do an analysis of that sermon as the follow-up lecture, okay? So uh, the sermon analysis is along the lines of, how did I get there? <laughs> we hope it's not a post-mortem, okay? <laughs> but, but the idea is, what can we learn from listening to a preacher talk about how she, and in this case, all four women, so how did she get to that sermon that she preached? What was she thinking about? What were some of her concerns? What were, what were things in the text that, that really jumped out at her? So that's the nature of this next, uh, this next hour together, is for me to provide a sermon analysis of the sermon I just preached. I'm glad I'm going first. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, then we have Barbara this afternoon, Raquel Letsom tomorrow, and Anna Carter Florence on Wednesday. So I'll start with uh, my analysis, and then my intent is that we'll have an opportunity for questions and conversation after, uh, after I'm done. We have two mics set up in the middle of the chapel so that we can all hear each other's questions and engage in dialogue around 
uh, this important uh, calling that we have. So I'll begin with some of the obvious things uh, that uh, I, of which I am always aware when I write a sermon and to which I am committed always when I go and write a sermon regardless, <laughs> and which you likely heard in this sermon. For me, as a preacher, I am deeply committed to the specificity of that author's voice. The uniqueness of the story, the uniqueness of how that author tells it's her or his story. And so this is true for any of the texts in the Bible, uh, but in this case, particular to the Gospels, <laughs> How does each of the Gospels portray Christ in a very unique way? And how are we attentive to that and respect it and listen for it and regard it? And so that we are listening to that uniqueness, and we could say the same too for Paul's letters. Uh, not, all Paul's, not all of Paul's letters are the same. <laughs> and there's some other things in the New Testament too, like um, Jude and uh, Hebrews and, you know, those ones in the back that we skip over. Uh, they have unique presentations and understandings of Jesus as well. So I always go to a text, regardless of the text, with how am I honoring that unique voice of that author? What, am I, what, spe what specific things am I learning about God? What is, what is this author trying to communicate to me and to all of us about who Jesus is and who God is. And when I say God and when I say, you know, theology and what is the theology of a text or what is the theology of a particular author, I usually run through uh, sub-theologies in my mind, not sub-theologies, but like categories of theology that we often don't think about. But I, I always do this with the text. And uh, so what I mean by that is, what is this text soteriology? Right? What does it say about salvation? Uh, salvation is not a uniform category in the, in the Bible. So what are God's specific saving acts in this text? What does salvation look like here? Christology, you know, the uniqueness of a portrait if it's in the New Testament. Anthropology, <laughs> what does this text say about me? What does this t text say about the human condition? What does this text say about us? We often forget that the Bible is a story about us, <laughs> right? And so what, is it, what does it say about us and our relationship with God? I think about uh, the category of ecology, how is God up to creation. <laughs> what is God, how is God active in creation? How is God active in our world? What is God doing? I think about the category of eschatology. These are all the words you can never use in public. <laughs> and in your sermon, right? Ecclesiology. <laughs> and just for good measure, let's add one more. Uh, pneumatology, right? What is, the, what is this text's understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit? because these are the ways in which God works in our world <laughs> through, through God's salvific acts, through the Holy Spirit, through the creation, through thinking about what our future life is with God. And so I will often go through and think about those categories as well. Another, uh, another thing that I always bring to the biblical text, regardless of how my sermon ends up, is that I always pay attention to the details. The details are a sermon in themselves. <laughs> you can build an entire sermon around one detail in a text. I'm convinced of that. And so, and I also, you know, I, I love literature and, uh, and I did a lot of like creative writing when I was young and I, I just, I love the details in the text. And sometimes we get so, caught up in what we need to say theologically that we forget that the theology is actually in the details itself. So I always pay attention to the details. Another obvious thing that I bring to the preparation of a sermon is a consciousness of contexts. 
right? This means the context of our congregations, the context of our local communities, our demographies, our nation, our world, the specific issues, situations, circumstances that need to be addressed. Uh, this morning, it was Las Vegas. So I woke up, uh, my sermon was done. <laughs> Uh, and thinking about where and how do I uh, think about that in this sermon? What does that mean for this sermon? And in this case, with you as my audience, because you are a particular context, I had in mind for this sermon how easy it is to forget that you need Jesus' love too. <laughs> that you are all about preaching Jesus' love for your congregation each and every week the people you serve, but how often do you get reminded of the fact that you need Jesus' love too, and when and how do you feel that? And I wanted you to feel that. I wanted, that was, that was, my, that was my context, to make the connection uh, that it was being loved <laughs> that makes Jesus loving the world possible. And so that was a specific area of context for me, for you. But also for this sermon, I had the, the, in mind the context of the act of preaching itself. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about lately what has been, how do we think about as preachers, what's important to you homiletically lately? <laughs> what's, what, how are you thinking about preaching lately? How are you thinking about homiletics lately? Or was the last time you thought about homiletics when you had to take homiletics in seminary? <laughs> because as preachers, I'm not sure that we do that often enough. This intentional thought around our own homiletic and actually also our own hermeneutic. So for this sermon in particular, I had two other things in mind that shaped how I, uh, how I approached this sermon a hermeneutic and a homiletic, and I want to talk a little bit about that. The hermeneutic, of course, is what, you, what do you need to preach, not just what your congregation needs to hear, but what do you need to preach, or what is your hermeneutic, or what is your hermeneutical imagination these days? That is, what is your interpretational lens to which you find yourself particularly drawn when it comes to engaging texts? We all have one. They change over time. <laughs> but where and how are we aware of what what interpretive lens, what, what are we bringing to the text in our making sense of it uh, that might matter for what we need to hear and what our congregation needs to hear? And then in terms of a homiletic, what is it that you are working on in your own preaching that you can then be conscious of in your own sermon preparation, writing, and delivery? So I don't know if we think about that in our preach, in, in our preaching life as well as, as often is what am I working on homiletically? Am I trying different things in a sermon, right? I mean, what am I, you know, I'm gonna work on gestures, you know? And so <laughs> you, 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 you print out your sermon and then you practice your gestures, right? Uh, maybe you wanna do that. What is that, what is, your, what is your homiletic that you're working on, that you're thinking about? because that's one of the ways in which our, I think our sermon stay, our preaching stays alive. So I wanna I wanted share with you the hermeneutic I brought in the preparation of this text, in this preparation of this sermon, engaging this text, and the homiletic that I brought to this text. The hermeneutic of which I have been the most conscious and the most deliberate lately is a feminist hermeneutic. And it's not just lifting up women for the sake of lifting up women. <laughs> but it's listening for and looking for ways in which the roles of women in our biblical texts point out, undergird, and lift up the importance of all people in bringing about the kingdom of God. Or in the case of the Gospel of John, so that John 3.16 might actually come true. So you have this anointing of Mary, or anointing by Mary. And so when I came to this text, I'm looking at not just the differences in the anointing stories, which are fascinating, right? Which you should always do, there are many. 
I'm looking at the differences, and there, of course, the details are significant, right? But I was particularly struck this time by the place of this anointing in the narrative, its location in the story. It would be obvious to look back and say that this is Mary's way of thanking Jesus for raising her brother from the dead. Really? I mean, that's part of it. But could there be something more going on there? Because I didn't want it to turn into, and it didn't ring true for me, a sermon about our own gratitude for all that Jesus does, including the resurrection. We should thank Jesus daily for resurrecting people. That just didn't work. <laughs> so I started to look forward and I started to think about this act of abundance that, that she's not just super thankful, like abundantly thankful, <laughs> like over the top thankful, but the way in which she embodies Jesus' own ministry here. Because pretty much everything Jesus does and did in the Gospel of John is abundance, right? The water into wine, so you know all this, the water into wine, like, look at the details of abundance there, right? John 5, the reference of that in the sermon was John 5, the man who was unable to walk for how long? 38 years. How long is that? His entire life, right? Uh, how, many, how long had the man been born blind? Since birth, <laughs> right? Uh, and... And how dead is Lazarus? Really dead. You know, I mean, every single thing that Jesus does, every single sign, every single miracle, signs in John, are acts of abundance. And so it's not just that, Jesus, not just that Mary is thanking Jesus for that abundant love. She's actually embodying it. She's witnessed this, she's experienced it, and now she's doing it. And uh, so that, I was really struck by that. And looking forward, then I was, then I, then I, you know, putting it in the narrative, looking forward, her act of abundant love, to what extent it makes possible for Jesus to do what he needs to do. <laughs> because his foot washing is an act of abundant love. But if you look at the details in the text and the verbs, if you want to do Greek and stuff, right? It's the same verbs that she uses, right? And so to what extent his act is an embodying of her act? And all of it, you know, and here the, with, with the foot washing, I was thinking about the foot washing as an act of abundant love, but here it's an act of abundant love for his disciples, because all the other signs have been for others. And now it's for them. Not that they were like going around, when are we gonna get some of that love? But I, I was struck by that. And every single sign is a demonstration of grace upon grace. And so that now the disciples then are these direct recipients of that intimate love that Mary first showed Jesus. Not that he couldn't do it without her. <laughs> But there is something in experiencing that kind of love, this mutual, reciprocal uh, love that I wanted to capture in the sermon. And then, when I begin to see that Mary's anointing of Jesus puts in motion the events of the hour, because it's literally like the very next story is Jesus going into Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, I remembered it was Jesus' mother that set in motion the events of Jesus' ministry. Because remember that in John, there is no temptation in the wilderness. Jesus is baptized. Uh, there's the calling of the disciples, but then there's no testing in the wilderness. So he's got baptism, testing, ready to go. That's not in John. He gets to the wedding at Cana, They've run out of wine, and his mother says, they've run out of wine. And Jesus says, 
many of you have heard me say this before, they should have gotten a better wedding planner. <laughs> okay? What? And then she says, do whatever he tells you. That she is the one who gets his ministry going. It's her that says, come on. I know who you are. You can do this. I've loved you for 30 years. And so, and then I look at Mary, and, and she's the one who loves Jesus so that Jesus can walk into Jerusalem. And so that these two women bracket the book of signs. You know, the book of signs in John, you have 1 through 12, and then, you know, you know that. Uh, and then 13 through 21. They bracket Jesus' ministry. The mother of Jesus right before Jesus' first sign. Mary immediately after Jesus' last sign. Wow. Wow. <laughs> now there's a feminist hermeneutic. <laughs> right? that the love of these two women embodies the abiding love of the gospel. So that was my hermeneutic, <laughs> right? I, I just am conscious of my hermeneutic these days of tending to where, I, where and how I hear uh, the roles of women in texts. All right, and let me say a few, what time is it? Okay, great. Uh, the, the other, uh, the other thing I wanted to share with you is my own homiletic that I've been working on lately, which is a work in progress. So I've been asking lately, how does the text embody its own homiletic? How does the text create meaning that is not so much the what, but the how? Or how does a text enflesh its own theology? or looking for the ways in which a text incarnates itself? These are some of the questions I've been asking. And so that means that I'm not only tending to the unique voice of John, but I'm actually also tending to how John wants to be preached. Does, it, does, does a text actually communicate a homiletic that our sermons should then do? Or are we bringing a homiletic to text that's actually antithetical to how it wants to be preached? So John's homiletic, <laughs> which you probably have already figured out, is that the word became flesh. And are you willing to risk the same? It means that I think preaching John has to sound and feel different that you have to tend to these, the sensorial, sensual aspect of this narrative, which why, is why I was immediately drawn to the smell <laughs> and lifting that up. You know, it's a smelly text, <laughs> but it's also intimate to the point of being uncomfortable, which is why you have Judas' reaction. And then the second thing I've been conscious of lately that really shaped um, how I approach this text is in part returning to a homiletic or a t an attention to preaching of scripture itself. And I wrote about this a little bit in my Dear Working Preacher column last week and the week before, so I've been kind of working stuff out <laughs> there but that the answer to biblical illiteracy is not more information about the Bible. It's not needing to know the stories better and knowing more of them. But to what extent the answer to biblical illiteracy or how do we make the Bible relevant or how do we make the Bible speak today is recapturing, reminding people that the writings in the Bible were themselves articulated witnesses to experiences of God. And isn't that what preaching is? An articulated witness to the experience of God. At least that's how we should start as preachers, because if we haven't experienced God in the text, we might want to pause and say, wait a minute here. 
So how are we articulating, how are we giving witness to these experience, this experience of God in the text? Because here's the thing, you know, scripture never started out as a creed or systematic theology. Never started out as denominational formulas to which you have to be beholden. It started out as witnesses to experiences of God. And how do we capture that in our preaching? I've, uh, and many of you have um, heard me say this before, Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene does not go back to the disciples and say, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, hallelujah. <laughs> right, she goes back to the disciples and says, I have seen the Lord, come and see. Well, she doesn't say that, but you know what I mean. Right? And so that's, that's a homiletic that I've been tending lately, that, that how much of our, our preaching in these past years has been too much about information, too much about topics, um, that the assumption that the biblical texts are lessons <laughs> and not actual encounters with God. And I also see this in part in, in what's going on in preaching right now, uh, that I'm seeing a tension. <laughs> I'm seeing a tension between assumed norms of biblical interpretation and those who are challenging those norms based on their experience of God. In other words, the tension between nevertheless she preached, <laughs> nevertheless she preached, Black Lives Matter, the voices of LGBTQIA, and politics don't belong in the pulpit, which is code for your experience of God is less valuable than mine. So this is a homiletic that I've been bringing to um, my preparation for sermons as well, is how the text itself witnesses to an encounter with God, and how do I capture that in my preaching? How do I capture this encounter with God that Mary had? And she, the only thing she knew to do was to embody that love for him. Okay, I will stop there so that we have time for some conversation and questions. There's much, much more that I could say, but those are the things that I wanted to be able to share with you as, uh, as I went about preparing this sermon. So that's the behind the scenes sermon analysis for this particular sermon. So we're gonna actually, if you have a question, could you come to the middle? So if you have questions, if you could come to the middle, otherwise we can't hear everybody. So that would be really great. If you could all make your way over there, stand there, come there be great. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Can you just expand on what you just said about those who preach the biblical norms and those challenging those norms? Mm -hmm. Just say a little more. That was very intriguing. Yeah. Um, what I'm, <clears throat> part of what I'm sensing, okay, or what I'm, uh, what I think I'm seeing is this this sense where there are certain things that don't belong in the pulpit. Um, we shouldn't talk about those things. As if, uh, and, and it ends up being politics don't belong in the pulpit, which is a bizarre statement to me because the gospel is political. Uh, and so how is it that that when we don't bring those things into the pulpit, we're essentially, to what extent we are communicating, that those experiences of God don't belong in church. That the way in which people are experiencing God and giving voice to God, giving voice to how God works in the world, you know, giving voice to who God loves and that they feel loved by God, we can't talk about those. We still need to keep talking about the usual, the norms of how we approach scripture and who gets to speak 
for their experiences and who doesn't, whose experiences are valid and whose aren't. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the, that's the you know, and uh, there's this one quote that I've been using, um, I think it's A. Brown, uh, that, that things are not getting worse, they're getting uncovered. We must hold each other tight and continue to pull back the veil, right? That, that where and how we're listening for the multiplicity of experiences and voices that are trying to give witness to a God they know, <laughs> a God they've experienced. And, uh, and where are we listening to all of those? Um, so that's, my, that's the tension I'm experiencing, you know, that you shouldn't be political because, you know, it gives voice to experiences that we all can't agree on. Well, they're valid experiences of God. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So Beth? why this text? Did you choose it? Was it assigned to you? But your your conference. So how did how did this text come? It to fell you? from the sky. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no, I chose it, uh, but I I I chose it because um, it's a good question. Why did I choose that text? Uh, I chose that text, in part it goes back to what I said at the beginning of, of thinking about this context and what you all, what I, what you all need to hear in terms of our experience, in terms of uh, what does that abundant love, of let Jesus love you. Uh, and then I also wanted to pick a text. I wanted to choose, actually, I, well, I've never preached a sermon on this text before. So it was like a personal challenge for me. <laughs> what, there's a passage in John I've never preached on? <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's like, that's something. Uh, and I couldn't believe it. Uh, and so I wanted to preach a text that I hadn't preached on, but also tending to that hermeneutic, you know, that is there something else in this text about um, Mary that might um, surface uh, with attentiveness to this text? That is not just, oh, she anoints Jesus' feet, but what else is, what else is going on there um, that, that, might, um, that might be um, important to think about? Yeah. So I did have, you know, there. There's reasons for choosing texts, obviously, and that's a good question because you should know why you're choosing texts. And sometimes they're for good and sometimes they're not. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I have a more mundane housekeeping type question. Yeah. Um, as you plan your week, how much time do you set aside for that particular type of sermon preparation? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, at least 30 hours. Uh, no, kidding. Um, so you don't no, sleep. No, that right? is a great question. Uh, you know, I've been able to think about this sermon for a while, so it's not as fair, right, to say I don't preach every week. You know, so it's, uh, although, I, you know, writing Dear Working Preacher kind of makes me, <laughs> I don't write a sermon, but you know what I mean? I have to think about but it's not the same, because I'm not working on delivery and all that kind of thing. Uh, I'm gonna back into that question. And I'm gonna start with, um, here's what happens, and I tell my students this, if you do not, if you do not uh, tend or protect your time for writing a sermon, nobody else will. So that meant that I had to do some of that this past week, which I normally don't have to do, right? So it means, uh, it means finding time in a week that was rather full to say this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to get done, and this is what's not going to get done. Uh, and... And, and I, I'm actually gonna also back into it by saying, I'm gonna quote Clay Schmidt again, and say you're never not working on your sermon. That's the other thing. 
you know, I sat down and wrote it. I mean, I, I you know, I worked with the text and, um, you know, did some of the, the connecting between Mary and, and the mother of Jesus. Um, and uh, and just, just my own thinking of that. Um, I, you know, I, I wrote into it, uh, but then I left a lot of time actually over the weekend to work on it. Um, because it was the time I had, you know. And so, you know, my son was at a golf tournament <laughs> and my other son was, went to the Renaissance Festival. Uh, and I, I, just, I just basically said to my kids, I'm doing this all weekend, you know. So I don't, that's not a very good answer. But the answer in part is you have to protect the time and you have to know when you work best. I work best, I work best in the mornings. So get up, get my, make my latte, and go sit on the couch, or go, you know, and write. Uh, but you also have to, um, I know that about myself, but I also know that, I, I also knew that I was never not working on this sermon. You know, um, really, since I decided to, when did, where's Justin, is he here? Uh, he's, oh, Justin, when did I give you this text? Uh, two weeks ago, so. I've been thinking about it for a long time. Never not, never not thinking about it. It's a great question. Yeah, John. Yeah, I had a, this is I had a question yeah. about, uh, do you find yourself ever um, feeling like you need to um, preach or speak um, against the text in a sense? Um, mm. I, I was thinking of the tension between respecting the uh, author's voice that you mentioned at the beginning yeah. and then the challenging accepted norms at the end. Um, and if you could speak about times when you feel like you need to speak up and say, I think the author missed something in this situation. Mm. That's all of Matthew for me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, here's what I think about that. I'm very gracious toward texts. I tend to give them the benefit of the doubt until I'm proven otherwise. <laughs> That's kind of how I work in life in general. Uh, and so I really, want, I, I really want to know what's going on there. Um, and so I'm very attentive to that, to listen to, you know, to to listen for that and to recognize the author's particular context, you know, what, into what are they speaking. Um, <clears throat> I also, at the same time, that question makes me think that there are a lot of texts that I think the tricky part is to realize when you need to speak against a text and when the text and when you need to realize that the text might not agree with you. Right? I mean, it, sometimes I want to speak against the text because I don't like it. It doesn't agree with me theologically. I, or I don't agree with it theologically. But it's usually the other way around. You don't agree with me? Why not? Uh, right? And so I have to test that out to say if I'm, am I wanting to speak against it because it doesn't agree with me? Or I don't agree with it? Or am I having to speak against it because um, sometimes that speak, and I'll say two things, sometimes that speaking against the text is not so much speaking against it, at the text as it is a corrective to the way in which the text has been heard and used. So sometimes it's speaking against an interpretation of a text uh, that has been misused and, and, and misrepresented. Um, but I do also think that there are, that we really take seriously um, maybe not speaking against a text, but to say that this text, um, we have to think really long and hard about the ways in which it's speaking into our world today. Um, and, and where it isn't, you know, where it isn't necessarily um, speaking into our situation, or where it isn't helpful to think about uh, the, some of the things that we're facing. 
Um, so that's how I would approach that question. It's just is a kind of a multifaceted sort of checking my own self to say, <laughs> why do I want to speak against it? <laughs> uh, but then also to say, um, yeah, also to say where and how it might actually, uh, like, you know, we've talked about in Sermon Brainwave before that, um, that there are certain texts that we think can't be read out loud in, in church if you're not going to preach on them. Um, like uh, Mark 10, you know, the divorce text. Uh, because of where and how do we need to um, not speak against, but speak into the text or be in dialogue with the text so that the text is um, not hurtful. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm thinking of your, your feminist hermeneutics and where I went in my receiving of, of your message. And one of my, uh, where I went was, I want to bracket it as a de derailing thoughts that I could see come up for me with having had an experience of someone sort of stalking. So, um, you know, that lavishing of love can like um, sort of erase the object. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm so in, in tension with that. And then I'm like, but oh yeah, I have to keep reminding myself of, remember it's Mary that's lavishing the love and she just lifted that up for and so that was powerful I found myself having to remind myself and then I I went to this place and I want to ask if yeah. what you think of it is Jesus in John perhaps also saying let Mary love you because um, um, I think it yeah. landed with let Jesus love us yeah, love yeah. you yeah yeah and so I don't know that's yeah, you know, a couple of things about that. One is, um, this is, I mean, in terms of your circumstances, of where, of where you experience, you know, a, a situation, a personal situation of lavish love turning into um, <laughs> not, not, right? Do you um, talk about but, that or do you set it aside? Yeah, yeah, and, and it's okay to set it aside, except that this is, again, where where biblical preaching is really important <laughs> in that in that um, that lavish that lavish love is t completely within the, within the context of John you know what I mean it makes right. sense of John yes. you know and what Jesus yes. has you know right. yeah so it's um, so it, you, you know the, the the biblical text is always that litmus test for you know uh, right. yeah right. Um, let Mary love you. I think that's really interesting, and here's why. Um, I find that fascinating because, and again, this would be like sermon two or three on this text, right? You know? No, because the reason I find that that's so fascinating is that when you then get further into the farewell discourse, where Jesus is talking about um, what, he, what he's imagining the disciples, how they need to be with each other, because he gives them the love commandment, like right? love one another as I have loved you, right? right? Unfortunately, that, the lectionary eliminates the Judas piece, right? So you skip, you go from verse 17 to verse 31b. And in between that is the fact, oh, by the way, Judas is left. So it's the loving, <laughs> the loving is not just, oh, wash Jesus' feet, but what kind of love that loves even the ones who leave you or the ones who betray you. And I think that if you fast forward that to John 21, that's really interesting because to what extent Jesus is asking his disciples to do the Mary love, let Mary love you, or let, or let, let, uh, receive the love from each other, yes. right? Because the only way you need to be able to receive that love from each other to be able to continue in what I'm asking you to do, right? That, that's the only way it's going to happen. And so when, when Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Well, tell my sheep, well, in part what he's saying, you're going to have to love some of your friends who might desert you. You know, you're going to have to love. So I think that that's really 
powerful to say it, it's 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 a because the mutual love. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. The mutual love is not just le let Jesus love you, but it's will you let um, will you let a fellow disciple love you? And love love the one you know is about to die. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 I like that. Thank you. Yeah. That's like yeah, sermon three or two or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. I found your sermon really engaging, which, if you're a parent with a baby in arms, well done. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not success right there. Yeah. Um, I feel like when I'm preaching, in order to be engaging, I have to have really powerful illustrations or be very contextual to what's happening in the world. Yeah. And you know, you talked about you know how much perfume have you bought in your life, and you yeah. said that your sermon was impacted by Las Vegas. But I would say it was subtle. Very. And so I'm curious if you can talk about mm -hmm. how you made it so engaging, maybe without that, without those illustrations, without that context, or uh, what the role of those are in creating a sermon. Yeah. Well, I am... Uh, my inclination <laughs> when it comes to preaching is to trust the biblical text story before I go find another one. So uh, I think that there is, I think uh, that in part what happens in preaching is that we don't think the text is engaging. And I'm not saying you, but I'm saying like that we don't think that we can engage just by the text. Um, and how the text really is embodying what we're experiencing in our world. And so, to what extent then, we don't trust that. And then, well, let me find a story that illustrates it. Um, or how I can apply it, which I don't like that term, because it, it, I've said this before, you know, it feels like you're putting on sunscreen. Um, <laughs> And so I, my, my, my style of preaching, if you will, is, is I very rarely will have a story. Very rarely. Because in part, I want to just sit in that text and see what comes, what comes out. And, um, and I, I'm not sure that we, I just wonder if in part, what we communicate when we tell stories in, te in sermons not that, I'm not saying like one story or, you know, I'm not, but it's like the sermons, like I had one pastor say, well, there are not enough, not enough sermon, there are not enough stories in sermons. And I'm like, well, how many stories do you need? I mean, <laughs> the story's right there. It's like right there, right there, you know. Um, but it's, but to what extent we then communicate that the, the biblical text itself can't carry the weight or it can't communicate well enough on its own. And so somehow we need to then bring a story in to um, make that happen. So that's kind of, I really just, I kind of sit, and that's why kind of I go through all those ologies that you can never, you know, definitely not an airplane that you can't say in public. I mean, just, just how the text is engaging, particularly anthropology. You know, how is it speaking to the human condition and then um, and then what is God's answer in that? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you may have just answered this with, okay. with, that, uh, with that question, but um, I recognize that especially a text like this that yeah. is pushing us towards experience of God's um, overabundant love, mm -hmm. um, we walk that line as preachers of deciding when to bring our personal story mm -hmm. in, even a, a small piece of it. Yeah. Wondering if that entered any of your sermon oh, yeah. thoughts of, of this one, of yeah. should I reveal a little of yeah. God's overabundant love in my life? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. It's there, but it's also really subtle. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> Um, and I'm not, you know, I, I agree. I think, you know, the, um, there's a, you're, you're absolutely right, there's this fine line between, like, TMI, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, but, but it's to say, you have to, you, you have to start 
from a place where you feel the text yourself. You know, where, where, and where it's not just in your head. You know, I have, I've got to come up with something to say about God. You know, no, but what is God doing for you? What is God, how has God touched you? How do you, how do you experience God in this text? Right? What is this text doing to you? And so for me, even though I didn't say, I remember a time when, yeah. or when I was, you know, 16 years old, or, you know, or, which is fine, I could have done that. Um, <clears throat> but it was very much present in, um, in a phrase like, hmm, um, <laughs> believing, really believing that someone really loves you. That you're, that you're enough, that you don't have to prove it, that you're not measuring up. I felt that, really. And so I didn't need, necessarily need to have the story, but I felt it. Does that make That's sense? That's really helpful, yeah. Because yeah. this was one that all of a sudden your story could have taken over mm -hmm. than the biblical story. The many, That's right. That, so. That's right. Yeah. And that's, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering, because you talked about discovering the, the hermeneutic and the, the sort of individual voice of the text yeah. or the, the book of the Bible that you're preaching yeah. from. Yeah. I was wondering, do you, do you tend, to, based on that, to do a sermon series on one book, or do you tend to stay with one book for an extended period of time? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, <clears throat> well, you know, I, I think, I mean, this is one of the blessings of the lectionary, theoretically, right, is that, you know, you're staying in one gospel. So there's a lot that you can then do with that one gospel of really, you know, remaining, abiding in that gospel. You abide more in John, but you know, um, you, can, <laughs> you can abide in Mark and Luke and Matthew if you want. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like really um, tending that. So, uh, uh, because I think, you know, this is actually a book that I kind of want to write. It's like, what is Matthew's homiletic? What is Mark's homiletic? What is Luke's homiletic? And I have some suspicion, I have some theories on that. Um, but I think the, you know, that's part of why I wanted to talk about it, that you're not just preaching, you know, when you're preaching Mark and when you're preaching Matthew and Luke and then, you know, John gets thrown in <laughs> here and there, uh, that you're not just preaching the, the uniqueness of the story or the particular theology or Christology of that gospel, but you're ac you actually are wondering, how does, this, how does this gospel want to be preached? And are you tending that as much you know, is there, are you tending that as much in your sermon preparation or in your sermon, you know, in your sermon delivery as you are what the text says? And so I think there's, I think it, the, 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 the advantage of the lecture is that's kind of already built in for you. But now we have to be intentional about it and say, because I think it's true that Luke's sermons should sound remarkably different than Matthew's sermons and Mark's sermons and Hebrew sermons, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, but I'm, I, and I think sermon series are good, you know, especially if they allow you to, again, to engage in a text in such a way that's not just informative, right? It doesn't just tell us stuff, stuff we need to know or need to learn, but how are we being preached to by that text, right? And I think that's important, yeah. And I admit that it's, it's partly a practical consideration because if you do a series, then you're not sort of reorienting yourself to a different book of the Bible, I think. Exactly. Exactly. And to give yourself permission to do that. Yeah, to give yourself permission to, um, to think about those questions as well, and not just, you know, what do I need to say, but how do I need to say it that really is honoring that particular voice in Scripture. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Let, oh, this is the last one. This is the last question. This is what Don tells me. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Yeah, Sherry. Thank you so much for your words already. I have, um, uh, I'm in a space right now where I am doing a lot of supply preaching. Yeah. 
And uh, so what's been coming to mind for me is I think of two recent sermons I've given. Uh, one was um, shortly after um, a couple of deaths, one that was very prominent in the media, and then one within our congregation. And so I speak of this as my home congregation I've been a member of for nearly 20 years. Yeah. And then there was another sermon that I gave at a congregation that I had virtually no relationship with at all that happened to be the Sunday of Charlottesville. And so uh, for me, I'm thinking about this too, like thinking about context. Mm -hmm. In this sermon that you gave, how um, might you approach this when you know your context intimately and when you don't know your context mm -hmm. intimately? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that, uh, because most of, my, mo most of my preaching now is like supply or guest preaching. You know, I don't, because um, I don't serve a congregation. Uh, and I think the, the, the key to that, uh, whether it's, an, you know, whether, in, whether or not you have an intimate relationship with the congregation or um, if you're, you know, <laughs> um, here you are, show up on a Sunday, right? Um, I think the key hermeneutically is where and how you're listening for what the text does to you because you're a human being. That's the commonality you have, right, with people to whom you preach or with whom you preach, regardless of intimacy or not, is that uh, the commonality is that you are uh, human beings in relationship with God. And so that, for me, ends up being the starting point to say, uh, to say, how is this text uh, speaking to that with which I have in common with virtually everybody in that room? We might not agree theologically, Christologically, soteriologically, <laughs> all those things, right? Uh, we might have no you know, disagreement on those kinds of things, but we can agree and we do all experience um, the absence of God, the love of God, the hope in God, uh, the abandonment of God, <laughs> right? Not at this all about like God, but you know, or, 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 or those realities in our own lives. And so it's to, to, to come, with, come to the text with that question first, is this how does this text preach into my own human condition that then I can articulate because this is what I can share because this is what we all share, because we're in relationship with God. Yeah, thanks, Sherry. All right, thank you all very, very much for uh, this. And thank you. Thank you.